Good evening, everybody. Uh, hello. <laughs> Good to see people are embracing the paperless approach to meetings of bringing their laptops and plugging them in. It's, it's a big, well, I know. I know. Uh, welcome, everybody, to what feels like another weekly meeting of the Corporate Services Climate Change and Scrutiny Management Committee. Um, on today, Monday, the 18th of March. Uh, I'll start with some housekeeping uh, announcements for our guests. Um, if you need the, the toilets at any point there behind me through the door on my left, um, do not try to get through the door at the rear of the room um, because if you manage to get through there, you'll be lost in the, uh, the corridors of West offices. Um, no fire alarm is, is is planned in the event that the alarm does go off. Please follow a someone wearing a CYC lanyard, and they'll um, they'll look after you. Hopefully. Okay, so I'll begin with apologies. <clears throat> I've received apologies from Councillor Waller, and he's substituted by Councillor Vassy. Um, I am expecting Councillor Eyre, but I think he's delayed. But he should be with us. Um, hopefully shortly. Uh, can I ask members if there are any declarations of interest, please? No? Thank you. Um, gender item two, minutes of the meeting held on the 29th of January 2024. Do any members have any matters of accuracy from the minutes? No. In terms of matters arising under work plan, um, there were there were a couple of items uh, suggested for um, potential task and finish group, but I propose to pick those up under the work plan item uh, later in the meeting. So are members happy for uh, for me to sign the minutes as a true record, please? Thank you. Agenda item three, public participation. We have <clears throat> one registered speaker who is joining us remotely, uh, and that's Councillor Andrew Hollier. Can you hear us, Councillor Hollier? I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Um, I understand you're speaking in relation to agenda item six on the agenda. I am, yes. So I'll... You have three minutes and I'll leave you to start in your own time. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, members will recall that immediately upon taking office, Labour announced cuts toward funding and then after some months of limbo, uh, applied a new funding formula intended to target more funding to more deprived wards. Uh, but a mistake in that formula meant larger and therefore usually more deprived wards uh, did not receive their fair share. This was the subject of a call in in October, and at that meeting, I attempted to explain the error in the funding formula, uh, that the element related to the index of multiple deprivation took no account of ward population, leading to anomalies like Bishop Thorpe receiving £1.50 per resident, uh, compared to Haxby and Wigginton receiving 87 pence, despite near identical deprivation scores. A ward like Westfield, which is the most deprived, recent, uh, received barely more than Bishop Thorpe at £1.76, and the scheme was riddled with these issues. Um, you just need to look at table 14 and the funding per person and you'll see them all for yourselves. Uh, whilst that request to rethink the formula was refused, I assume that the error would just be quietly fixed behind the scenes for next year. So I was absolutely stunned to see in this report a recommendation for option A or option E. Just to go through those options, and it's slightly difficult to tell because some of the background to the calculations has only just been provided this afternoon, uh, so I haven't had a chance to look through it. Um, and the error in the previous year's formula was only obvious once those were examined. Uh, but I thank officers for now providing that information. Uh, option B can obviously be immediately discounted. C and D, whilst broadly how it used to be um, done and with the benefits of simplicity, uh, clearly don't have the support of the current administration, so are non-starters. Uh, options A and E bring forward the same error found previously at the call-in, and no account is made for the population in the £145,000 element. If they're chosen, then this needs to be fixed. I'm utterly bewildered how these are still in the mix. The cynic in me does wonder whether in reality options A to E have been put in as draw men uh, to promote option F. 
which does appear to take into account ward population, I think via households, and therefore to some extent mitigates the previous error. As such, I'm assuming that option F is the ladder for Labour members to climb down to avoid the embarrassment of having to row back on their opposition to the call in reasons. It's clear that none of the options are perfect, they all have flaws. Uh, to a large extent, that's why the previous administration just allocated by a number of ward councillors. But it is very clear some are far more flawed and unfair than others. And a scheme intended to direct uh, funding to the most deprived wards that gives Westfield residents 14 pence more than Bishop Thorpe, which is completely mad. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hollier, and uh, your comments will be taken into account when we reach that agenda item. <clears throat> so that's all we have under public participation. Uh, agenda item four is York Central update. Uh, so can I invite officers and guests to come and join us at the table, please? Thank you. So, as members will be aware, major projects are within the um, the remit of this committee. We received an update uh, on progress with York Central in November of last year, um, and shortly after, um, the uh, lead developers were confirmed. Uh, so we agreed that uh, we agreed to return to this item once the lead developers had been appointed in order for. Um, for us to continue our discussion, to get an update on uh, the stage of the project, some of the, the challenges, some of the opportunities um, to give uh, partners a chance to, uh, to to talk to us and for us to ask any questions or um, make any suggestions that, that members wish to make. So you're very welcome uh, to, to this committee. Um, and I'll hand over to David to introduce, please. Thank you very much, Chair. My name is David Warburton, Head of Regeneration with the Council. Um, just a couple of introductory remarks, but the main business, as you've highlighted, is to receive the update from our partners, uh, Tom Gilman from McLaren Regeneration, who's going to give you a short presentation. Um, but we've also got in attendance tonight Stephen Hind, um, Head of Business Development with Network Rail, on behalf of Homes England and Network Rail, the landowning partners, and Tom Devine representing the National Railway Museum um, and they're willing and obviously best place to answer any questions that you may have that you weren't able to address last time we attended in November. Um, I'm hoping I can uh, take the report as read. I would just highlight at paragraph two, sort of two very recent meetings earlier this year, 12th of February, uh, partners attended the lead members um, group uh, and provided an update there. And at the beginning of the month, um, partners, including developer partner, presented to the Holgate Ward Committee um, as well. Um, there's one further update. Um, some of you may have seen in the budget, there was an announcement of a significant funding allocation um, from the Leveling Up for Culture Fund, um, £15 million awarded to the NRM in support of their transforming uh, vision. And again, if there are any questions on that, Tom Devine um, will have more details. Um, I think the only other thing to, to, to just flag was you um, interrogated us um, in November, um, and I think one of the items that, that was raised specifically was financial support. So just to note uh, the update at paragraph nine um, for the committee there in terms of the council's support, funding support for the enabling infrastructure. And if that was all, I'm going to hand over to Tom Gilman from McLaren, who's going to talk through their ambition for phase one development on York Central. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Welcome, Tom. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to give a, a short presentation on, um, on York Central. Uh, as David said, um, we have been the selected party, we were selected party prior to uh, Christmas. We're currently going through, thanks David, the, the legal process at the moment. So that's concluding and to be concluded, I think in the next week or so. So contractually, we will then be the selected party. Um, 
We have been undertaking uh, various stakeholder engagement and working with the council and um, the stakeholders NRM, HE and NR um, on various work streams and are keen to get stuck in and start um, bringing some of this forward. The first phase of which will be Museum Square and we're working with Tom Devine and NRM um, on that. It's good to note that we've got planning as of February um, and we're currently undertaking a number of work streams with them and looking at bringing that forward uh, and getting on site in summer of this year um, for delivery as quickly as possible, subject to IP2 works um, and uh, demolition of the existing buildings. Uh, there is also a, a current application in tow for a, a large corporate occupier um, as part of this, and um, we are working with their design team just to move that through to stage four design. Uh, and again, subject to getting planning in, I think it's targeted for the April committee, um, we will uh, continue that work stream and look to start again on site uh, in, Q in Q4 of this year for delivery in 2027. Um, then aligned to that, we have quite a large aspiration for the wider phase one, which I'm just going to talk you through now in terms of this presentation and and be mindful that this is just an early um, iteration and uh, this is not the completed design. There's a process to go through, there's planning to go through, um, but it, it gives you some idea of what we're going to try and do for the phase one and sort of the aspirations around the scale of it and um, bringing forward together a development which gives a sense of place and space at the get-go and try and, and, and really be impactful in that next few years. So I'll just click through. I thought, oh, not used one of these before, so hopefully this works. This is um, the master plan for York Central, um, which I hope everybody can sort of orientate themselves around. You've got the sort of light blue shaded area, which is the museum. Um, and the the white bit in the, in the middle is the existing residential. So all around that is the York Central, which at the moment comprises around two and a half thousand homes and over a million square feet of, of commercial space. The blue in the right hand bottom corner is where the commercial space is located. And the brown around the public park is the residential elements, just to give you some orientation. Um, so in terms of um, phase one, that sort of falls into three parts, which is A, the museum square, which we've talked about, uh, B, the, um, the, the the corporate building. And I, I've got an arrow here. What's, how do I point? Is that pointing? No. Anyone see a pointy thing? No. Um, that's not working. Okay, well, so the corporate building lies just off, and apologies for trying to describe it here, but it, it lies just off Muse Museum Square to the south of the blue shaded area, which has, it hasn't got a red line around it. That, that forms the new corporate building, which is around 200,000 square feet gross. And then what uh, McLaren Arlington are looking to bring forward in conjunction with those two work streams is what's outlined in red. Um, which, uh, again, quite difficult to describe from here without being able to point, but you've got that public realm space immediately adjacent to the station, a hotel. Which one point? Hmm? Okay, that'll be, yeah. Can you, can you reach up there, Stephen? <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay. Yeah, that's right, which comprises an additional commercial building of around 100,000 square feet, um, some additional public realm, which um, works in with the museum square. So you have the really substantial public realm space. And then that in yellow um, is a hotel, along with a new Western Station entrance, which links into the new bridge across from the station itself. Oh, well done. <laughs> Who did that? <laughs> Um, and, and we'll come to some images of that which may be able to give it some flavour as well and then uh, the further red line which um, is to the um, west of uh, the, the corporate building you can see some residential units the public park 
and then some further residential. So all of that red line going all the way around it, that's exactly it. Um, that is around 900 residential units, as well as the majority of the public park. So we, as McLaren Arlington, as the, as the new developer, are looking to bring forward that scale of development as part of our phase one, which will work in conjunction with the Museum Square and the corporate building we just talked about. So the aspiration for that is to get an application in, or it's reserved matters application in this year, with we'll start on site in 25 and delivering in 27. So by the end of 27, you'll have the new museum square, the new corporate building and the wider phase one. So the, the, there is that sense of place and space from the get-go. That's just a, a summary of those, those three elements to phase one. So the museum square, the government property agency, Western station entrance, new public realm, hotel and 900 residential units. And that's split across affordable senior bill to rent. That's um, a CGI. I mean, clearly this is going to move forward as we move through the detailed design phase, but that's looking from the corner of, um, I suppose, the museum back towards the station. Um, to the right, uh, just being cut off is the new government property agency and the building in the middle is the new office building and the building to the left is the hotel with the public realm, which is the cold, well, known as the cold drops at the moment um, in front of it. That's a slightly different angle, um, picking up the new Western Station entrance and looking back towards the Minter, Minster and um, uh, the railway station. And that's the hotel in front of you. Again, an image around what the residential may look like. And the public park that we'll be bringing forward. So the public park comprises around 17 acres. And we'll be bringing forward around 85% of that in phase one. Um, so a substantial piece of that public realm. And that's the sort of image looking back down towards um, the station. So those are the slides I have. Um, that's our aspiration. We're working yeah. with the, the council. Uh, to bring forward that application, as I say, in, in um, 2024, uh, with a view to getting on site uh, next year. Thank you very much um, for that update. So I'll throw it open to, to members for any questions or comments on on where we are with, with the project and some of those um visualizations and it all starts to look a bit more real when you see what it <laughs> what it might look like councillor Rowley. thank you chair can i just compliment the team on on, on where they are with this project and, and thank you for the uh, presentation it's been really really useful really helpful um the addition of 900 new homes is vital for the city i think everybody would would agree with that um and whilst i appreciate that the devil is in the detail i'm just curious whilst we we, we, we strive as a council to have kind of net zero and to reduce car use and increase. The reality is projects that have tried to do that in the past have, have come a, a cropper, really, because people will not abandon cars. And whilst that's a long term ambition in terms of the 900 properties, um, again, whilst it's probably too early to give a definitive answer, what what what. Um, provisions are made for parking within those. I appreciate obviously the, the details a long way down the track, but I'm just curious. Um, I think, to be honest, we share your aspirations. So uh, as we, um, when we put our submission in, we really focused on five Ps, which is people, place, planet, prosperity and partnership. So um, th this is about creating the right place. It is about making sure that we do that in a sustainable way. And that's not just sustainable, such a big word. That's not just, you know, construction methodology. It's not just about embedded carbon operational carbon but in terms of making a sustainable place um that's really key for us so i know we are in dialogue with the the council at the moment um it, it feels like an anathema to me that we're going to have long-term car usage within a location that's so close to the city center and i personally have an aspiration to see that there are going to be less cars in 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 this site but we've got to work through the process with the council to do that um 
So th that's the direction of travel that we'd like to follow. Clearly, there's, as you say, there's more uh, detail to be undertaken, but I would like to see reduced level of car usage, not just from a commercial and residential, but across that, across that scheme as a whole. Thank you. Again, I, I say that's an aspiration we've got to work through with council. Yep, council Rowley. And again, thank you, thank you for that. I say I think everyone over around this 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 table, you know, have that, that ultimate aspiration to see the reduction of car usage. The reality is, certainly in the last 20, 30 years, where we've because this isn't a new aspiration. I think we've had it for a long time, where we've tried to develop um, residential units. To, to, to you know with with that aspiration in mind of having little or few cars the reality is we have we have residential developments that don't have streets big enough for on street parking the, the parking problems get moved around it's just whilst you have this aspiration it's not going to be a, an overnight people will dump their cars even in the next 30 years if we'd halved car usage by 50% even in a development like this in the city centre, there will be those people who will have a car, and it's and it's when you look at when. So I guess for me, it's 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 not allowing the aspiration to ignore the need, because there is an aspiration, but the the reality is that you won't get rid of every single car. So in terms of the development, aesthetically, it looks fantastic, it looks brilliant, but you don't want it to be spoiled by fifty cars, fifty percent of cars that have nowhere to go, and therefore. You know, it, it, so 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 by being ahead of the game and making some provision for car parking and car usage, you are, you're not abandoning the aspiration. You're just being realistic in terms of how you plan forward. Yeah, no, agree. I think the um, the direction of the travel has to be that, to be honest, as in re reducing the amount of car usage. But we have to be cognizant where we are sit today, and the and the. I suppose the benefit of York Central is, is a multi-phase development. So you have the ability to work through that over a period of years. So the, the first phase might allow some car parking, and then as you move forward, it might reduce in terms of its um, in terms of its usage. But you know, I recognise I recognise the issue. Um, I think we've just got to make sure that it works in an aesthetic way, and and make sure that the place works as well. So. If you are car parking and there and there is those on on the site, we do want to make sure that they're not parked on streets which aren't um, workable because that just impacts upon the place. So fully recognised. Uh, David, uh, Warburton, sorry, yeah, go on, David. Thank you, Chair. I mean, just for members' uh, benefit and to confirm, the outline planning application sets some fairly rigorous standards in terms of car parking standards, anyway. Um, I think what developer partners are saying is that that's an outline planning application from 2019, and it's absolutely right to have a dialogue with the local planning authority as they look at making reserve matters applications in 2024 to make sure that they are looking at the world that, that exists today and and and, as, and looking forward to building this out over over a period of time where there has been, you know, quite a shift perhaps since 2019. But there are some challenging targets in there and the developer committed to those conversations. Yeah, and I think it's incumbent upon us to do that. I mean, we, we can't just ignore the, the, the impact on climate change. We have to, you know, grab that by the horns. And so this is an opportunity to do it. And what, we recognise those uh, parameters. But, you know, let's not that, let's not make that, you know, stop us from looking at what we can do. Thank you. Councillor Vassi. Thank you, Chair. I've been watching this, I suppose, on and off for about 20 years. And I'd like to just put it into some kind of context by referring to the Bandstadt development in Heidelberg in Germany, which is roughly the same size as our railway goods yards and indeed is a, on a railway goods yard that became vacant at the same time as the York Central site. It's now complete. It provides six and a half thousand homes and is one of the largest passive house districts in the world. It was completed in 2022, created 6,000 jobs since work began in 2010. The homes in Batstadt have annual carbon emissions for energy use of just 0.13 tonnes per inhabitant, compared with the UK average of 2.2 tonnes. All the buildings, public and private, have been built to passive house standard and the district's energy demand is met fully 
by a nearby wood chip combined heat and power station, which is part of the local district heating network. Barnstadt's cost has proved comparable to non-passive house developments of a similar scale, and 20% of Barnstadt's homes are social housing. Next to the central railway station, it's been designed to minimize transport emissions. A tram line has been extended to include three stops in the area, while 3.5 kilometers of new cycle paths connect the district to the city center and other, and other neighborhoods. A network of charging stations for electric vehicles has been installed. Walking and cycling are encouraged in the new 1.5 kilometer public park in the district. Lastly, to reduce flooding in spring and autumn, the district has water retention basins that allow rainwater to infiltrate the ground rather than flood the sewer system. Chair, I'm not, uh, I think Councillor Lavassi is fantastic <laughs> and is one of my allies across was, the floor, but is, is there a question coming I, in? I'm there really is a question I'm, going to come. There is that's a the context. Going to come. And I say that with Councilor absolute Payne. love, trust me. No, I understand. Uh, yeah. I understand. I'm trying to put a context to all of this. Uh, yes, I, I, I thought you were. Um, Bernstadt has got 66% of all its roof is a green roofs. And then we look at what we have here. In the sunset of the fossil fuel age, we're having a discussion about cars and, and, and getting answers that try to move the dial, but leave us more or less stuck in the same place. Um, I just have to say, after 20 years, I know in, in 2009, we had a vision statement the council produced that said we have purposefully not set out a vision. It actually used those words. And I fear that's why we are where we are. And my question is, what can we as a city council do to help you raise the bar as we go forwards in this? Because I think it's clear from what you've said that you share the aspiration to make this a sustainable development. But here we are in 2024, two years after the whole of bandstat has been finished, and we've yet to start, and we've yet to really have a landmark sustainable development that I suspect everyone around this table really wants to see. Okay, over to you. <laughs> Please feel free to share, and if anybody else wants to... Uh... <laughs> To comment, please do. I'll, I'll just make a couple of remarks, Chair, to yeah, yeah. set the set the scene again. Going back to the the standards that are set by the outline planning uh, application. So again, it's always going to be possible to improve on those, and it's always going to be impossible to do better. Um, the design guide, the sustainability standards that are mandated, they are the minimum. And beyond that, I think yeah, I'm going to bring in Tom now to to say where he sees uh, the developer being able to respond to those and go further. But I think, you know, when you're describing the, the, the German example there, I think actually a lot of those things do apply to, to what we already have secured at York Central. There will be pedestrian and cycle linkages. Um, there will be 20% um, affordable housing. Um, there will be the opportunity for passive house. It's not mandated. Um, we won't have tram stops, but we will have the diversion of park and ride services running electric buses through the site. So I think there are some things that are, are very comparable. Thank, Thank you. you. Probably just to add to that, so Stephen Hind from Network Rail. Um, this site's been very difficult to, to free up. Um, so it was operational railway land. It, it's taking um, a lot of effort. Um, so one of the first significant items, we got the housing infrastructure grant, which allowed us to start looking at infrastructure. Um, and, and we've used that also um, to move off our operational, um, our maintenance teams, our operations teams, and, and also the sidings. Um, so we've had to find alternate space for those those sidings and, and build new, new um, infrastructure. Um, so... The land wasn't there to develop straight away. It's taken a lot of effort from both the council, Network Rail, Homes England, and the North, the, the Railway Museum, all working together to try and free that land up. Um, we've now probably got 80% of it free, um, which allows a phased development phase, um, which we're, we're now starting. Um, I think the other landmark we've got now is actually having the development partner on board, um, which now 
allows us to move into that next phase. Thank you very much. Councillor Merritt. Oh, I was going to respond further. Did you... Oh, yes, sorry, sorry Councillor. Yeah, please I mean, uh, Listen, I, I really applaud your, uh, your passion because that's exactly where we are. Um, we are, I appreciate there's been a lot of time period to get us to this point. We can only deal with what we've got and how to bring this forward at pace, which is what we want to do. So hopefully in time, you'll be saying it's great that the developers brought this forward in this time scale. But all of those things that you talked about, there are some standards that we have to meet in terms of the, the planning. Those, those are the minimum standards. That is not what we necessarily want to deliver. We want to deliver better than that. So you talk about passive house. Passive house is, is great and it provides some guidelines, but you can do it better. You talk about um, you know district heating network. We're, we're speaking to the university at the moment about um, the geothermic opportunity within the site, which York has a really strong opportunity with, you know, drilling down in the aquifer to get some proper sustainable energy from the site. So there are lots of work streams and ideas that we've got as developer. Where we, I don't want you to be talking about Germany. I want you to be talking about York and say, this is an exemplar scheme. That's that, what's that what we want to deliver. You know, I'm from York. This is where I was born. This is my city. I want to deliver something that is exemplar, not just in the UK, but across Europe. So we have really high aspirations. And the great thing is we've got great support from Homes England Network Rail. Their, their bid process was born on qualitative um, responses rather than commercial. So th this is not about the money. This is about the outturn of quality. And the council are working really well with us. We want to improve on that affordability piece. We recognise that York has a really um, difficult challenge in terms of affordability and housing. So how do we improve that? Not 20%, but 30%, 40%. How are we going to do that? So we are aligned with any of everything you've just talked about. And proof will be in the delivery. I accept that. But please recognise that we are really passionate about delivering the best we can with for this summer. Thank you. Can I respond very, very briefly? briefly? To I, 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 just to applaud those remarks, thank you for that. I'm really pleased to hear it. My dream from the word go has been that people would arrive at York Station and on one side they'd see a beautiful historic city and they'd go, oh, I really must go there. And on the other side they'd see New York and they'd say, I really must go there too. So I hope that in the months ahead, we, we manage to get heads together to make that happen. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Merritt. Yes. Um, I'd uh, you know, like to echo uh, some of Christian's point, but applaud uh, the attitude that you are bringing to this development. I think it is a massive opportunity. Uh, for us to actually do something significantly di different that uh, many of us around this table have hoped for decades. Uh, in my case, I think four now. I uh, put a motion to council with my then ward colleague uh, about the opportunities of this site. I think it was either 1983 or 84. <laughs> it's, it will be good to see. Um, but we can we can do it differently. And as the... Uh, results, both of uh, the previous administration's uh, consultation on its climate change strategy uh, and the current consultation on a local transport strategy, which is going to uh, the executive this week, very clearly demonstrates that notwithstanding the fact that a lot of our travel has been car based, people recognise uh, in overwhelming uh, numbers in terms of the majorities in that survey, uh, that we have to do things differently. Um, and there, there is the will out there. Uh, so I actually think you have an open door from the York public, uh, but also I think from the majority uh, of councillors uh, across party, frankly, uh, 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 on this council. Now is the time to do things differently. And this is the site that we need to do it on. Um, so uh, I would, however, like just to pick up um, some other aspects of the uh, uh, proposals. One of my colleagues who's, uh, who's not here this afternoon asked me particularly to raise this. Paragraph 11 of this report uh, re uh, talks about a minimum of 20% of the new homes must be affordable over the life of the development. And she was perplexed. perplexed by that latter statement over the life of the development. 
um, in terms of what happens afterwards. Do we, you know, do we lose the affordable? And that obviously depends on the mix of the types of affordable. The other key issue, of course, is affordability. Uh, you know, the government, the government standard of uh, rents at eighty percent of uh, market rents are not affordable in the York context for a very large proportion of our population. Uh, ditto the actual discounted for sale properties are also well outside uh, the the uh, a large portion of the population. We have been displacing a lot of our population because York is so unaffordable, particularly around the housing. So uh, I think there are key questions to be asked and answered uh, in terms of the mix uh, that you bring forward in terms of those, those that new housing development and how you deal with the affordable housing issues, uh, which will be crucial to us tackling a lot of the problem. Uh, I'm I'm involved in the local bus forum, and you know we have a lot of discussions with the local bus companies. You know they've had major difficulties the last year or two in terms of driver recruitment and retention. Their their work, you know, the, the main bus operator in this com company made the point to us that actually two thirds of their employees come from outside the city now, because basically we have lost uh, so much of that population. They don't pay the type of wages. That uh, uh, can, yeah, people can live here on. So you know that that's the massive social challenge that we face. You know, we obviously want to see that this site goes as far as possible uh, in addressing that challenge. Thank you, <clears throat> uh, David. Do you want to make start with that? Thanks, Chair. So just to clarify, in terms of the the wording in the report. Um, and there were questions on this um, in November as well. Um, the outline planning application secures 20% affordable housing. So of the up to 2,500 units in the outline application, 20% of those must be affordable in accordance with the council's affordable housing policy. Um, in terms of how there may be a little bit of difference between particular phases, that is for the, the, the detailed planning to um, to, to work as reserve matters applications come forward, but there is no escaping that 20%. Um, I've also uh, just like to highlight at paragraph 12, apologies that it's under the, the housing section, that in addition to that 20%, there is also a 5% requirement for um, community or custom or self-build. We, we were talking briefly last time that that's likely to be a form of custom build rather than perhaps self-build plots mm. on, on York Central. Um, but I think now really to hand over to the developer to perhaps talk a little bit about, you know, what, what key worker housing may look like, what the opportunities might be, because again, Tom's already expressed a commitment to work with partners and with the council to try and increase that 20%. The, the wording of the report, there's no intention that that's implying anything other than the 20% that is mandated by the outline planning. It was simply the way it was put over the term of the, the development. Okay. Would you like to add, add anything? Um, just to say that I agree with everything that you've said. I, I think we as uh, developers recognise the challenges that York face from a housing perspective. So how can we be part of the solution? Uh, and that's what we're exploring um, at the moment with uh, stakeholders and with the council. Um, and and you, yeah, you're right. Twenty percent um, is it affordable with a big A or a small A? I think we put you know we get into the detail of that, and it's got to be properly affordable. Um, and um, certainly, we want to deliver more than twenty percent affordable. And um, we're working with um, a, a well-known registered provider within. Um, York, who uh, has expressed an interest in a substantial amount of affordable housing. Uh, we're working with Homes England on the funding of that. So on that first phase alone, we are looking to bring forward a substantial amount of affordable, you know, uh, properly affordable housing with different types of tenure and mix, etc. Um, those are early discussions. I appreciate, um, you'll appreciate that those, I can't give you too much detail at the moment, but um the sort of direction of travel is exactly along the lines that you talked about. 
because we recognise the issues that you're facing. Thank you. Uh, bring in uh, Tracy Carter. Tracy, you'll be uh, you'll be only too aware that we actually do own a tiny sliver of land on York Central. It's about five percent of the overall developable area, um, and we, as part of our housing delivery program have a commitment to delivering 100% affordable passive house housing on, on, on those lots of land. The shape of that particular piece of land, is it's uh, shaped a bit like a dog leg. It's not particularly developable on its own. So we're into discussions uh, with Tom and his team later this week, I think, uh, about how we might be able to bring forward a scheme within our own housing delivery programme to uh, to make sure that in the very early phases of, um, of York Central's residential development, we also have that up the upfront boost of 100% affordable on one portion of it. So we start to exemplify the kind of housing that we want to see on York Central. And, and that goes for the um, sustainability criteria as well, of, of aspiring to that passive house standard uh, of affordability. I mean, the, uh, you asked questions, uh, Councillor Merritt, about um, housing being affordable in perpetuity. As you'll know, government policy is that all social housing is subject to right to buy. And over the last uh, 30, 40 years, we've lost um, a half of the council's council uh, housing stock to that particular scheme. That is the biggest hole in sustainable, uh, in affordable housing um, and, and the, the decrease in, in the extent of that. There are a range of tenures that are counted as affordable, um, which some of which include discounted market uh, from market sale uh, products and um, shared ownership products, which obviously are affordable at that first point, but lose their affordability with time. The, the kind of the the base point for affordable housing uh, in York, where you have the great disparity between housing values and wage levels, uh, is is a real challenge. York Central can't solve that for the city. Um, we hope that through the uh, forthcoming agreement to the local plan will be increasing house building in the city um, in totality 18,000 new homes coming into the city of which between 20 and 30 percent of those will be affordable that will be the biggest increase in, in affordable housing in the city um, since after the after the war I believe. Thank you. Could I just uh, pick up one thing David mentioned around <clears throat> custom build being uh, preferred self build could you, for everyone's benefit, clarify? I think most people understand self build. Just clarify how custom build differs from self build. I'm actually going to invite Tom to answer that. Okay. I think he's probably better placed to oh, answer. That's fine. Um, so, self build is uh, effectively given a plot of land and you go in and you deliver it yourself, which, as you can imagine, has some challenges when you're looking at a larger regeneration project like this. Um, so custom build is when you're getting input from, um, let's say, well, 5% here. So let's say the, the first phase is um, uh, 1,000 units. It's going to be 50 units. So you get 50 people coming together at, as one, as a community, going, I want to deliver a, a space, a community, which is aligned with our interests. So they have input on design and uh, layout and uh, input, but we deliver it just from a health and safety perspective. That's so much easier to do rather than having 50 people going on and delivering their own houses. We control the delivery process, but they are involved in the whole process process prior to that design input and community engagement and everything else. That's a difference. There, really. no, that's fine. It's just, it, it has different names. It's seen as you know uh, community housing, but it, custom build, it's... But they can um, often be involved in some of the finishing or inter internal build and, and providing yeah, labour yeah. to support that as well to make it yeah. a more affordable product as well. Great, thank you. Um, can I ask a quick question? A question around um, community involvement. It was good to see that you've attended a ward committee meeting. Um, obviously, we know from the site that it is bordered by established communities on. Uh, uh, on on all sides, and and it's it's been really helpful to understand <clears throat> kind of your approach. And cause at the moment, it's been the partnership has very much been the public facing um, uh, sort of presence for York Central. I just wondered what um, how that will change going forward in terms of your roles um, as a um, sort of community player and and liaising with and informing and consulting with. Um, 
I suppose all those residents, particularly those who live closest to the site, who um, obviously the, there's there's a degree of awareness about the impact that any development will have in terms of um, a degree of inconvenience. But how, how are you? What's your approach in terms of engaging with the the community? Um, I think you're right. So it's been managed by HE and NR to date, and and clearly that has to remain the case until we're in a position legally and to take it forward. I mean, we have been taking undertaking some um, community engagement in conjunction with um, the stakeholders uh, and, um, you know, Councillor uh, Taylor invited us to Holgate recently and we had the opportunity to present there. Um, and I think once that baton passes, which will be uh, in the short term, then we're really going to ramp up that community engagement because for us, um, that's really important in getting that support from the surrounding communities, but also the wider um, the, the wider city. Uh, this has to feel like it's a development for them, uh, that it's not done to them. So um, that engagement piece is really key for us. And there'll be a series of workshops and um, community presentations and engagement processes. We've already started to put that in place as a structure and a programme and as soon as we're, you know, we've we've got the control of it, we can then um, move forward with those processes. And I'm quite happy to share what that looks like. And no doubt there will be many people around this table involved in that, as well as we engage with the with the key um, with the key communities around the site. <clears throat> Thank you for that, um, Councillor Taylor. Thanks, Chair. You've sort of asked one of my questions, which which I'm grateful for, and and. Uh, I like the answer we've received and it's probably worth saying that you know early conversations with the master developer have so far felt positive in terms of wanting to involve the community and you know and this is my phrase rebuild a bit of trust most of the city is behind this development and recognize the opportunity that it brings but there are some local sensitivities there and some things over the last few years haven't been handled as well as they could have done but you've sort of asked and answered that question. So I had one other question relating to communities, which is about sort of when it's all built out, how can how can you guys ensure that there's a bit of hustle and bustle across the site? So you've got the commercial area, you've got the residential area. Is there much wiggle room for having, and these are just, I'm just spitballing here, you know, a corner shop, bakery, cafe, dotted within the residential bits so that, you know, it's not like thousands of dwellings or everyone's living like guinea pigs and they don't come out unless they're going to work and then you don't see them again once they've come back from work. How can we sort of make sure we've got a community like that? Because that's got to be a positive, hasn't it? Uh, 100%. Um, I mean, you've got to create these communities. That is the, you know, how do you create a place? Um, you know, there, there was some uh, examples earlier about how you do some of that. Now, we are looking at all of the exemplar projects across Europe about how you do that. And we've got some really uh, amazing people on our team who have the experience of doing it. But that is really key. Uh, what you've just talked about is really key in terms of making that community um, and making it a vibrant community and making it feel cohesive as a whole. So will there be bakeries? Will there be corner shops? Yes, absolutely. I think there's um, requirement in planning anyway, but we would be wanting to do that. Um, but there's also that sense of ownership by the various um, residents around. And how do we do that? We've got to do that through engagement. We've got to do that through getting them involved. You know, that public park is a huge opportunity. You know, that sits there like a, like a heart of the whole scheme. How does everybody feel like that's their space? We need to get them involved in it in the management and maintenance of it because it feels like their space um and uh, there's meanwhile uses and there's arts event and cultural activity so we've got all of the uh, you know these sort of um, ideas and aspirations cultural strategies uh, arts strategy community me uh, meanwhile uses etc all of which we will deploy to make sure that that place feels like a home feels like a community and it'll be dip and it'll be a number of communities. It won't be one big one. It'll be a number of little communities, all of which hopefully interact positively. But I agree with you entirely, uh, Councillor Taylor. That is that is what we need to do. And I believe we've got the right strategy. I'm very happy to share that with you and go through those some of those finer details. But that is absolutely what we want to do. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> just on you mentioned the park, the um a few weeks ago at the Design Awards launch event. I think one of the architects whose name I cannot remember 
um, give a, a very in interesting and impressive presentation about the 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 York Central Park and 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 his firm's role in 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 realising that. Um, David. So it was Neil Porter of yeah. Gustav, Gustav Porter, yes. firm, and thank who, you. Um, who was in, involved in the master planning, uh, working with Arup. Um, I think mm. I think Tom knows. Neil. Yeah, so we know Neil, and we've retained him to work with us on delivering some of. I know obviously he was involved in the master plan, but um, if you look at what else he's done across Europe, yeah. there's some some fantastic mm. stuff. So um, we've we've got a meeting coming up on. Um, I think it's Wednesday, but um, or Thursday. But we're starting to move that now in terms of the design and how we're going to. You know, we're taking from a bid stage now to delivery stage, and you know mm. this is the exciting bit. So the public park is really uh, key to the success of the wider development. So mm. his involvement, I think, uh, is crucial to that because he's got got some great vision around it. Yeah, no, it was, it was really interesting. Do any of the members have any? I just uh, just like to add. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's aware, but five percent of our profits will go into a community impact fund, which will help help manage and maintain that park for the long term. So we are committing substantial amounts of money to that process to make sure that that's maintained properly for the for the future and for the future use of uh, your or your residents. Great, <clears throat> thank you very much. Do any of the members have any other questions on what we've heard? Councillor Merritt. Yes, just uh, one other question on the um, the uh, employment side. Um, note the uh, council's ambition in in the report. Obviously, um, office offices uh, nationally are um, not as in demand as they used to be. Changed working processes and so on. How is that side of the uh, development uh, going? Uh, what's your feeling on how that's going to pan out? Yeah, I think everybody recognises the challenge that the uh, office space um, has at the moment. But I think the, the opportunity here is quite unique for York so that, that we don't have a central business, business district in York at the moment. And um, here we've got a really, we've got a blank canvas. We're, you know, we're right next to the station. In terms of sustainability, it's about as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. We're in a beautiful city with lots of benefits around it. And we've got some great universities. So the the opportunity here is is quite unique for for us to bring forward commercial space, which can really bring in um, not just local businesses but national businesses is is huge. You've got a government property agency coming in in, an exist, uh, in a new first building, which is two hundred thousand square feet. So that's going to bring forward jobs immediately. But then, how do you create a sense of place and space around that? And thinking about some of the um, I suppose some of the, the demographics in York and some of the strengths around York. I mean, I think we will recognise that York is probably a bit of a post-industrial city, and I apologise if that's then nobody takes offence to that. But we, let's let's look at the jobs for the future for York and, and what we can bring into this. And York Central represents that opportunity. So do we do we play on the back of the strengths of like Bio Yorkshire and Ferrer and Ask and Brian with, with the GPA and DEFRA and look at that food science technology piece? That's a potential growth industry and helps solve some of the issues that face the planet around feeding the planet, et cetera. So that's a really nice piece to work with and, and, and grow. You've got a very strong rail industry and engineering technology and that side of things. That's another strand which can play into it. And then looking at the university, I think it's I think it's um I think it's disappointing that the retention of um uh students, these great universities and colleges that we've got. There's only about well, well, the retention rates better than I am, but it's fairly low. So how do we improve that? And it's about creating those jobs. It's about creating affordable housing for those graduates. And it's about creating the place as well. So uh, I, I think whilst there is a, a short term malaise maybe in the commercial space, what we can do here if we create the right vision is really create a place that is of national significance and will, uh, will attract a number of occupiers to it. Thank you. Tracy? I think we're, we're facing a paradigm shift on um, commercial office space at the moment. It's uh, The journey was hurried along by COVID, but I think everything that we've seen since then has seen a massive move away from the kind of long-term let per company. It's easy in, easy out. It's it's about place. It's about the experience of being at work and how that relates to your kind of work-life balance. 
with York Central, we believe that that, that product is the one that, the, that there is a demand for. And if you can see how we're using the building we're sitting in today, um, uh, there may be f available office space across the, the rest of, of the city, but this is, is is a kind of successful model for how you can use those broad, uh, bigger spaces in a different way uh, economically. Uh, if if you, if you em embrace the all of the benefits that we've got to support hybrid working, um, and York Central in that respect sits at the very heart of the regional economy for for office space uh, and will be. Um, undoubtedly a high priority for an incoming mayor uh, for the combined authority in May. Thank you. David? I think just a, another couple of points. I think um, the, the the number of employees, the number of civil servants that the GPA is looking at is about 2,500 is, is the number that's given. They're not all going to be there every day. That's based on the kind of occupancy that you're seeing um, in West offices now with council staff and other partners, um, which seems to be the average in the market generally. I think the other key point is, again, Tom will know this better than I, um, but but all of the indicators in the office market are that, that tenants are looking not just for easy in the out, but they're looking for the highest quality and the highest environmental standards in their offices. And if you're building new... Tom's already outlined that is exactly what they're going to do. So that is why, you know, we should be optimistic about the opportunity at York Central, because if anywhere is going to attract new opportunities, it is somewhere that offers those things. Thank you. Um, Councillor Vassi, and then we'll then we'll move on. Just a very brief response yeah. to what's been said there, because I sat for four years on the regional pension fund committee. And I can say that there's a real appetite in institutional investment for industrial space that is developed to the highest environmental standards, because it's they see it as a, a great long term prospect. So I think the opportunities are all there going forwards. No, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Tom, and and other guests. It's much. Uh, it's good to meet you and thank you for coming and sharing your ambition and your vision. Um, and thank you, David and Tracy. And we'll we, we, it'll probably be maybe in about six months' time or we'll I'll be guided by officers when the next, I suppose, an appropriate juncture would be to have a, another discussion and see how things have moved on and um, keep everyone in the loop and, and feeding in ideas. So thank you very much for your attendance and participation. It's much appreciated. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to agenda item five, which is workforce development plan and attendance management. So if I can invite Helen Whiting, uh, the Council's Head of HR, to come and join us at the table. Hello, Helen. So Helen's report uh, provides a summary of uh, key achievements, challenges and next steps within the workforce development plan uh, and just give us an update on um, attendance management as well, which is a, a topic that we've um, discussed on this committee over all the years I've been on it. Uh, it's just useful to have a, a catch up on, on where we are. So, Helen, I'll leave you to introduce the report. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So this paper is actually a carry forward from January. So sorry, I wasn't able to uh, to um, present on the day at last minute, um, but I'm happy to bring a further report, which I think would be quite useful for you in May, because um, there's some things that will kind of move on, certainly in terms of the workforce development plan. We renew those in um, May time. So again, it will be useful to do that. And obviously you'll be aware We've had a corporate peer challenge, which obviously does impact on the workforce. And a key part of that will be to embed that within the um, workforce plan. Equally, we've just gone through an employee survey and the actions associated with that will fit into the workforce plan. So I think it, it might be opportune for the um, committee to actually see that as we're going forward. So yes, as you mentioned, this is twofold. So it's looking at the workforce plan and the attendance rates. And what I've done, I'll assume that it's, it's taken as read. Um, I've attached our current workforce plan. This was at quarter two, so I think other things have actually happened um, and I'll, I'll be able to update on those. In terms of attendance, obviously you'll be aware 
workforce resilience and well-being is absolutely crucial, especially as we're working through at the moment. You'll be aware that we've obviously got um, a number of change management issues going on at the moment with the um, uh, budget, etc. And we're still in a cost of living crisis, so we've still got that at our heart. We need to be able to make sure that we're supporting employees all the time. We obviously seek to maximise attendance at all times, but from time to time, some people aren't able to perform their duties because they're actually poorly from work and we're there to actually support them to do that. I would say that, and I've put a paragraph 25, um, I've given you some details of where we were at quarter three in terms of 2023, and that we were sat at 11.3 um, days, and that's per FTE, and that's how um, you could be aware if you've sat in this um, committee before, that's FTE days. Looking at that as at January, we're sitting actually at 11.34. So there's not been a change from quarter three, which is the end of September um, to um, January. That has remained the same. I would say I was quite surprised at that because actually we have, and you will know from the wider world, there's been some quite nasty COVID viruses going back around again. I would actually say that we are in a much better position we were than quarter two in 2022, which sat at 13 days. Um, when we talk, obviously, about sickness absence, there is no standard sickness absence. If you've been in local government for a long time, there was always what we called the best value performance indicator, where every council used exactly the same sickness absence calculation. That's no longer the case. So we can't compare apples with apples in terms of sickness absence for other authorities. What I can say is that I sit on a... Um, a regional group from other HR directors, and we are largely comparable in terms of our figures, although we don't actually calculate the same way. Example would be some authorities exclude apprentices, some people include apprentices, some people exclude people who are on maternity leave, some people exclude people who are in their notice period. So there is always lots of different variances there. I have provided for you at paragraph 26, um, some national benchmarks that you can actually see. The CIPD, which is the Chartered Institute of Personal and Development, um, have always done benchmark figures as part of their Wellbeing at Work report. They didn't do it during the COVID period. However, they've just um, produced that again. And you can see there at paragraph 26, the box, you can see that um, the benchmark across all sectors was 7.8. Again, all sectors don't have the same calculation there. And again, that's days. Um, and for public sector, it's um, 10.6. But if you compare the 2021 and the 2023 mark, you can see that there's been a marked increase. So there is that shift of sickness absence to increase there. In terms of what we're doing, that's something you'd be interested in. We obviously continue to ensure that our managers are equipped to deal with um, absence management, take a compassionate and empathetic approach, but at the same time, making sure that we are um, dealing with sickness absence, we have a range of different options uh, available through our um, employee assistance programme and our occupational health, which has been proactive. Um, we um, encourage managers to look at things at the earliest opportunity um, as soon as an employee is absent. And the beauty of having our current um, occupational health provider is it's the same provider. and it's, it's one contract which we procured in July last year. So our one day absence, which you may well recall from previous um, meetings, our one day absence management is where an employee phones up to say, sorry, I'm unable to attend because of absence. That can then be escalated straight to occupational health. So we've been able to get that transition to be able to act immediately and also give advice. And they also help triage and they have also, because we've got qualified advisors at the end of the phone, they can triage straight into um, um, NHS services as well, which is really useful. Um, I've talked about the most common reasons for absence, which are also mirror the ones from the CIPD members, uh, sorry, report. So you can see that realistically, we, we, we are on a kind of a national trend, exactly the same as other employers. Um, I think that's probably all I've got to say, Chair. And if there's anything that, mm -hmm. any questions on how to state them. Thank you very much, Helen. <clears throat> so members have any questions? Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Um, I've got four themes of questions, so I don't know whether to kind of go with the first couple and let you answer those first and then come back. If yeah, that's, that's all fine. right. Yeah. Um, 
So the first one um, was under health and well-being on page three. And you mentioned about the employee assistant programme um, and how there's good awareness of it and calls have been received from all directorates. But there wasn't anything in there about like its use over time, whether it's gone up or down, uh, whether it's been more used um, or not. So it'd be interesting to know a bit more about that. Um, and then also related to that point was the staff survey plan for January. Now, I imagine you you touched on the fact that this report was supposed to be for January. So I imagine that's the survey that's just gone that's just happened. Um, and I wanted to check how often they actually take place. Is that an annual thing? Is it do you have any sort of kind of monthly check ins? Um, so that's the first couple of points. And then. The second thing was on page five in paragraph 21, and it was about L&D taking place in employees' own time, which I was really shocked by, um, kind of asking employees to do L&D for basic skills in their own time. So it'd just be good to understand a bit more about that and why that happens. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Helen. Okay, so the first we talked about the um, employee assistance usage. Um, I mentioned we've got a new provider as of July and those statistics are just coming through. So we again, we can't compare like with like with our previous provider. So they are, they are I think we've just landed one in January actually, but I haven't got those details. Um, but yes, it's something we're certainly going to be monitoring as part of the contract. Staff survey, um, we did one in January and we're just collating the information that we presented to our corporate management team later this week. And that will then be cascaded to all of our employees. How often are they done? They're yearly, they're annually at the moment. Um, so we will continue those. And the questions that we've got are largely the same. There were some new ones and there is a theme within there that's health and wellbeing as well. So we have got the ability to benchmark some of that. Um, just very quickly, I did have a percentage which was quite interesting for you. Um, we did, and I thought I'd scribbled it down. It was asking about whether the health and well-being, the council supports health and well-being in terms of the environment. Um, and that was a, an employee's opinion. And it was good to see that in terms of agree and strongly agree that had gone up from the previous year. So there's, there's some comparability there. Um, and then L and D in your own time. Yes, this was just something that um, it wouldn't necessarily be required for own own development for their um, jobs necessarily. It was for staff who didn't necessarily have Microsoft skills required for their jobs, but they requested that they could have something through um, through through the York Learning. So it wouldn't be a case of I need Microsoft Office skills for my job. Therefore, would I enhance it? That's there anyway. It's people to be able to access it who don't have it. Okay, so like, there wouldn't necessarily be like an expectation that they would give up their own time to do that, like that it would be part of their job, basically. Yeah, there's, right? there's no expectation. Okay. So if you want to enhance your skills and don't necessarily have it as part of your job at the moment. Thank you. That's reassuring. And then the, the final couple of things um, on page six, I just wanted to clarify the figures. Um, you said that average um, days of sickness was 11.3 days. Um, in the table, it says 1.3 days. And now I know when you spoke, you said 11.3. So I imagine that's just an error in the table. Um, and also, I, I just kind of wanted to check on that because it seemed the 11.3 days seemed very high. Um, and I know you kind of did say that long-term sickness does skew the average. Is there, is there anything else at, at play there? Um and then the final thing that I wanted to ask about is what is office attendance like? Because I'm often here in an evening, so don't really kind of see people out and about, but just be interested to know kind of what the atmosphere is like, um, how how often people are coming in, um, what the feeling is or any evidence around that. Okay, so I'm going to, take... I'm going to put your microphone on now, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll go backwards on that. So office of feeling, um, obviously, some of the results have come out in terms of the employee survey, and there was an ability to talk about, um, we didn't ask for feelings, but we said, you know, what's it like to be an employee here? Um, and um, flexibility and um, hybrid working is always very welcomed. Um, officers, we do have um, over 50 officers who come into the office every day, and that's either for um, personal choice 
because they haven't necessarily got, and this is part of cost of living, this is part of um, being flexible, um, who haven't necessarily got the, it might be they have got space at home um, or it's conducive or they need to work with others or there's reasonable adjustments here or whatever. Um, we don't dictate you must come in three days a week or whatever. It's obviously based on service requirements and that's based with um, managers and employees and with teams because it's really important and we always emphasise that it's important to actually um, engage with teams, etc. cetera. Um, you mentioned about one point something, it was 11.3. Sorry, I've missed that. I think it was, on, it was just a presentational issue with the table. I think oh, right. one of the ones had fallen off the edge of the... Right, okay. The table, I think. Because mine's showing as correct, so it might be yeah, just... Um... I think it was just a presentation. Right, was. okay. Um, 11.3 days, is that particularly high? No, it's 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 not. And because I was saying about our calculation, um, it is the health of the whole of the organisation. So I don't perceive that to be particularly high. We've got to support individuals who aren't off. Unfortunately, we do have quite a number of people who are terminally ill, um, and we don't automatically say, "Oh, you must leave the ca you must leave employment." Um, it's down to individual choice. So we may be supporting people to actually die in service, and it's what's relevant for them. Um, and that's obviously also based on occupational health um, within that. So to say, am I overly concerned about eleven point three? Yes, but no, because what the the important thing is is we're supporting employees and making sure that we're that the attendance management is there accordingly. So, thank you. Um, I'll, yeah. Just to double check. So that is over the year, isn't it? That's not. That's an average from the quarter, but over the year. Yeah. It's that's the and yes, that's the and it's um, rolling twelve months. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Chair, and congratulations, Helen, on answering the bulk of my questions before we even got going in the introduction, because I had the May update, the peer review, and the January survey as key issues, so knowing that that's going to come forward, I think would be really helpful, because this would have made sense in January when it would have come, but now it does seem a bit at odds without any, having any of that information. The question I suppose I had around this, and it's concerned more than anything, is paragraph 31 on, I've got it as page 21, and if we could... <laughs> Please be some differences between online and the old fashioned paper, but you make that reference to staff working excessive hours in terms of vacant roles. Corporate saving 07 is specifically targeted at vacancy management this year, which is £600,000. And the description along that lines was not replacing posts other than where statutory, strategic, or grant funded. So that outlines a policy of not recruiting to the vast majority of posts we had. That's gravely concerning. That's a shift from where we were, which is probably an in-year use of vacancy management and through a vacancy management board and system controls. This does flag concerns to me, and it, it's how can we as scrutiny check on how that's being applied, what that's impacting and what that is happening across the authority, because especially certain roles. I mean, if I was a member of staff in some departments, I would be hugely concerned reading that particular saving, once you once you take out statutory strategic or grant funded, that means you can be looking at anybody sat in your office and going, well, if they if they leave, it's just me now. And it doesn't have a strategic look to it because the description literally is, if you leave, we will not replace. So it's how that is managed, how that's going to be managed and how we as scrutiny can, can oversee that and have a look and insight as to how that's working in practice. Yeah, absolutely. I can answer that because I'm actually part of the cost control panel. So we are looking at all statutory. However, there is business cases. So I can say, um, for instance, um, garden waste this morning, we looked at officers being able to actually deliver the garden, garden waste. Sorry, do you want to carry on, Helen? Um, if it, we needed officers to be able to deliver garden waste because some people had moved up to different areas. Um, yes, we need to deliver that. So that was there. It's not necessarily a statutory service, but we look there. We are still continuing to monitor agency workers. And we'll review that. We are putting three months process on um, any agency worker. So we will not say it's a blanket. We will have them for a year. Um, going on in terms of the excessive hours, we are questioning all overtime to make sure that's right from a well-being point of view, hence why it's in this report. We are making sure from that perspective and how things can be done differently, because it's not just a case of always repeating things the way that they have been done. It's making sure there's work. And that's been done with um, 
managers, heads of service to look at how things can be done potentially differently. You might say no to one job, but say, well, could we do it slightly differently in a different way? And that's been a big part of the vacancy management aspect of it as well. So every case is looked at on an individual basis with the um, appropriate um, director and um, having an element of challenge really from um, the cost control panel. Thank you. So from a, and I'm guessing through the staff survey, you'll look to pick up any um, <clears throat> kind of unintended impacts or um, issues that might arise in terms from a staff wellbeing perspective. That is that where you would look to to kind of check and monitor for any um, sort of adverse impacts. Absolutely, um, we're doing that, and also we're having six weekly, um, frequently. At, um, staff forums for people to ask questions and that is a popular question to be honest and we do do that reassurance to make sure that's there that's headed by um the coo ian floyd myself and debbie mitchell generally but we also have other senior managers that represent there as well and it's not a blanket no it's similarly with training that's not a blanket no we need everybody to think very carefully about any training is it essential as part of the job if it's part of the job that we need to consider we'll look at that, but also looking at other alternatives as well. Thank you. Councillor Healy. Thank you, Chair. Um, there was £50,000 in the budget for, I believe it was a qualities training. Can you just, a qualities training? Could you just outline what that's being used for? Would you like to answer that, Councillor Lomas? I, I can answer it very quickly. It's not a qualities training. Um, it's to fund a post um, to ensure that we can fulfil our obligations um, under the Equality Act. Um, and that is in progress. And there'll be reports coming forward um, quite soon around the um, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Action Plan. But okay. that will fund, but it's not for training. No, no, no. I just heard it was for trial. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay. Thank you, Councillor Lumis. And you had a, a point you wanted to make as well. Yeah, just on the vacancy management. Um, vacancy management is a is a an art as well as a science, I think it's fair to say. And it's really important that we monitor carefully where those vacancies are sitting. And if, for example, you had a team of, you know, five people and three of them have just left and one's retiring next month, then clearly you're going to have to do something to make sure that that um, service area con can continue to function. Um, that might not necessarily be to, you know, go and advertise and fill all of the vacancies. And we have to take a really strategic approach to this and make sure that we are building a workforce structure that mm -hmm. suits the smaller council um, that we are becoming and not create problems for ourselves by just filling vacancies um, because it seems like the right thing to do. And the vacancy challenge panel is doing exactly that and is looking at what is needed. How can we make sure this service area can continue to function without simply continuing to do what we've always done? Thank you. Councillor Steeles Walshaw. Yeah, my comments on uh, page. 16, I think it's paragraph uh, eight, and it's about the introduction of the national uh, living wage from the 1st of April. Um, and I just wondered if this included contracts that were procured by the council and if it kind of can't be in that way, how much weight is giving to the social value policy when making these decisions around the contracts procured by the council? So the living wage foundation rate um, from the 1st of April is applied to um, employees. It comes in in October, November. Um, we apply it and that's part of a local agreement for our employees to apply from the 1st of April each year. Um, and that has been the same every year and we confirm it every year as well. In terms of social value contracts, I'm not involved with that. It's um, it's a it's a procurement aspect, I'm afraid. Um, somebody else might be able to answer that, but I am not involved with that in terms of social um, social contracts. We've got we've got procurement on the work plan for the next meeting, so that that will make sure we pick that up then. Um, is that okay? 
Yeah, um, I do have another question, but, it's, go for it. yeah, but yeah. it's not related to that, if that's no, no, all right. No, no. Yeah. Um, another one was on the pay structure um, and about how when, so when people are uplifted because they've previously been below the national um, living wage, I'm just wondering how that works in the pay structure as a whole, because it can work where people who were previously in different roles and now some people are, who were in a more senior role are on the same wage as the people who were in a lower role on, are on the same wage as people in a different role that they were previously in. So I just wondered, is there a pay structure? I know there's a pay structure review planned, but I just wondered how soon that was possibly going to happen. I would say we are very close to that in sense of a supervisor being on the same grade as um, their employees. They are not at the minute. We do that assessment every year. So we have got nobody that is, for instance, being a supervisor on grade four and their employees are on a grade four. We have it's very marginal, I must admit, but we are not in that situation as yet. We're pending a pay award come the 1st of April um, from the local government employers, obviously. That has tended to be much later in the year when it's actually applied, but obviously it's backdated and they're very alive and aware to this issue. And it's something that we can be sensitive to, but can't react as yet until we've got the pay award through. So. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Myers. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. And thank you for the report. I um, just wanted to ask about Workforce Development Plan, page 26. Um, where it discusses the HR policies. So I just want to ask maybe a general question, but also lead into a specific one about relations with trade unions and how the policies and guidance documents are signed off. So it says that CCNC signs them off. So... That's the Corporate Consultative Negotiation Committee. I'm assuming that that's going to have the three main trade unions that are uh, have a recognition agreement with the council sat around the table. Does it have attendance from all three? And are there any policies and guidance reports that are signed off or have been signed off without the agreement of that committee? No, in short, the Joint Consultative Committee, yes, um, that attends all three unions. Um, there is a quorum for the actual attendance at the meeting, but in terms of a policy, if one of the one of the three unions doesn't actually attend, that information is sent out to them for them to be able to attend. Um, but at the um, actual committee, we'll have done all the work beforehand. We actually work with the trade unions to deal with any changes to actually any policies. Um, before I can give um, an example in terms of the um, new changes in terms of flexible working obviously we've worked with them it's legislation we need to make those changes the council is actually already prepared and we're, we're, we're covered by that anyway but there is a few changes um, there we'll get that ratified effectively and agreed at um, joint consultative committee at corporate consultative committee but we'll have already worked with the trade unions there um, and there's no contention, but yes, absolutely, they're 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 involved around the table. Yeah, Councillor Myers. Thank thank you for for that answer. Uh, I guess there's I've got some specific concerns, which I think are probably best outside of the meeting. Actually, I don't want to um, disagree with what you've said because. Um, but I'm just aware of some concerns and I'd probably want to pick them up with you. Uh, We're going to have to do a, them offline. In a better problem. forum, I think, because I don't want to um, have the wrong information. But I, I'd, I'd, I'd want to stress that um, I think at this point in time it is really important that we do have really good relations with, with our recognised trade unions. And... Um, I, I think historically, if you look at the level of involvement of those recognised trade unions, it's very low now as 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 what it used to be. And, and I think as an overall point I'd like to make uh, to members and to officers is that we'll get better workforce development with a, a greater degree of um, cooperation with the recognised trade unions. 
Can I read Yeah, Helen, that? yeah. Um, we've, we've got no plans to change our recognition of trade unions. Um, we obviously don't get to find out how many members each of them actually have. Um, I do believe they've reduced over the years purely because when we've had strike information through, we know information um, membership has reduced. Employees also tell us they've reduced their membership from trade unions. We've got no plans to change our trade union recognition agreement at this point in time, and all three unions are still working with us. Um, but if you've got any specific concerns, obviously quite happy to hear those. Thank you. Councillor Vassi. Thank you, Chair. Um, in health scrutiny, we often talk about the vacancies in adult social care and staff retention and the difficulties of recruiting. And it's quite often in the context of the cost of outsourcing and a desire to employ in-house staff to cut costs. And there's, a, there's discussions going back and forth on that issue. So I'm interested in the comment on page 34 uh, under resourcing where it says, ensure our approach to recruitment and retention encourages and nurtures talent. And then the critical bit for me is either through direct employment or other delivery models. So I just want to understand what that actually means. Are we talking about retaining people by no longer employing them, by outsourcing? Just if you could clarify that. So what's actually best for the service? Sorry, I haven't got the same page numbers as you. I've only got my report rather than the full... Ah. But uh, sorry, I think I, I know what you're talking about. Okay. Um. So, but in terms of um, retaining staff, yes, what we're trying to do is actually retain as many staff as we can, and that's by when we're talking about the um, budget implications, etc. We want to retain that talent wherever we can, whether it be across the um, within their own directorate or across the council, without a doubt. Um. Delivery models, there is a number of delivery models, but we have got pinch points where we can't necessarily recruit, which is why we use agency workers. We have used agency workers, but also our agency spend has significantly gone down um, and we have um, we, we, we have reduced agency workers. Similarly, we've had agency workers who've actually become employees, which is an immediate reduction in terms of our budget. So in terms of the attraction in, as, as an employer, we've been able to attract those for people to come. Um, we don't have a specific um, strategy in terms of how many services that we will outsource. It's just simply a case of, you know, what is the best service? But we we are struggling, like every other employer, on some really key technical roles. Um, social care is still an area. Children's services have done great in terms of social workers. Um, we're nearly up to employability. And in, so, in children's um, social care, we've actually only got two agency workers now. There's been a really big push there. We've done a lot of work within HR and working with directorates to go out there and sell um, our benefits and be attendance at recruitment affairs and have a little bit of creative recruitment, to be quite honest. So we're doing that. But it is all about making sure that we retain talent. And we also um, in, in this in this current climate when it's quite difficult with pay, to be honest, um, but also show that we're a good employer in that sense. Does that answer your question, sorry? Um, yeah. More or less. So, so, so if I'm right, if I've understood you correctly, this is about people who are maybe outsourced or working through an agency about bringing them into the council rather than people who are working on the council encouraging them to become an independent uh, with all that might imply in terms of costs, uh, trades union affiliations, all of that stuff. It, it, it's that relationship between the staff and the council. We're certainly not encouraging people to walk to, to walk out and be consultants to the council. OK, so. thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Chair. I think, yeah, Christian Manley, that sort of thing. That I've the same comments I made at the SMU when we were looking at sort of information we have about employees. As the, the financial situation hits, we are going to become more and more a commissioner rather than a direct provider of services. And the vast bulk of what we do will actually not be delivered by, by council staff. How do we then start to shift what we're doing here, which does tend to be very focused on how we're looking after our own staff? If, as we say, 60% of our budget is adult social care and children's social care, and we end up being a commissioner of those, then actually that means 60% of the workforce are not being, as we noticed at SMU, we don't know the demographic data, we don't know the equalities data about any of that, we don't know the attendance management figures, we don't know how those staff are being treated. 
is there a plan going forward as that shift becomes more acute to start looking at how do we use our commissioning role in terms of looking after our staff well-being as well as just as a direct employer? Yes, and this plan was written in May. We're in a very different position uh, last year. We're in a very different position this year, hence why I said we will be providing a new plan going forward, which will have to take into terms the um, new budget and the corporate peer challenge and everything else. So we need to take that forward. We do know um, we, we tend not to work in terms of attendance management. We work in terms of sickness absence, but that's certainly a metric that we can look at. It's something I've been used to using in terms of metric um, it's much more positive as well in terms of rather than sickness absence, I would rather talk about that we've had 95% attendance or 96% attendance. Um, and that's quite empowering in terms of the of the workforce as well. So, yes, but as we change, as we are changing in terms of a workforce, we will need to change the workforce plan, hence why it's it will be rewritten. If I could flag just one example, home care. Home care support, and that's one particular area where people do struggle in terms of terms and conditions, pressure, and the issues around that. So I think that's definitely in one particular area amongst others that we need to be aware of. Okay, is that a, a further point on that issue? Thank you. I, I just refer you back to the the answer to the question that Councillor Steele's Walshaw asked earlier that that there's an opportunity to look at procurement processes, which is where you can build in the um, added social value to the um, to the procurement process so that where we do um, contract work out, um, that we can build in those really, really key important things like real living wage um, into our procurement processes. Um, so that's possibly a question for um, that meeting. Thank you. I'm going to draw this item to a close because I'm conscious that <clears throat> Helen is kind of to come back in May um, um, to continue the discussion with obviously new information and new um, new context. So thank you very much, Helen, um, and we will see you soon. Thank you. So I propose to take a quick break. Um, it's just. Four minutes past seven, if we can reconvene at ten past, please.
Hello, members. Uh, welcome back to the last last segment of our meeting today. Um, our next agenda item, agenda item six, is ward funding. So, by way of uh, background, there was a call in last October relating to a very specific element of um, the allocation methodology for ward funding for the 23-24 financial year. Um, and <clears throat> officers and executive member kindly agreed to bring this back for a further round of um, uh, scrutiny ahead of uh, determining the approach for the allocation of this particular element of award funding for 24-25. Um, so that's, that's what I thought we were here to discuss tonight, and that's what I intend to discuss tonight. The The report's very helpful and, and perhaps goes a bit further than um, <laughs> I would have expected it to. So I, as I see it, we're looking, essentially, you're asking for a view on... Um, uh, models A, E, and F, as I as I as I understand it, um, in terms of looking at potential ways to allocate that that um, uh, specific element of uh, of ward funding. So I think that's that was what was subject to the discussion at call in, and that's what I think we're here tonight to ask members if they have any views on on the the, the potential models that have been put forward. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear at the beginning of the discussion to try and keep our discussion focused um, and, and for it to be of some use to officers and to executive members. So I've said my piece. I'll now invite officers to say anything they wish to say to introduce the report. Thank you. On the basis of that, Chair, I'll keep it relatively brief. <laughs> Thank you for introducing the report. Um, and uh, clearly there are several models for members' consideration in the report. Um, the models are, themselves are outlined in paragraph 11, and as a result of your introduction, I'll not go through each one. Um, uh, the table in, in paragraph 12 um, goes through the pros and cons. The table in paragraph 13 talks about what that what does that look like in reality with um, each of the models applied to um, the total fund amounts. Uh, paragraph 14 looks at the outcome of the models on funding per head. Um, just, for, just for context then, um, since the 23-24 ward funding allocations were made, the key data behind the uh, the allocations through the uh, multiple, uh, the index of multiple deprivation, that's not been updated at national level um, as we'd hoped and, and that update's not expected for another 12 months. So in reality, if the existing model was prefer preferred, you'd be looking at the same allocation being made in the next financial year. Um, provide Providing ward budgets based on a split of an element based um, on funding per councillor and an element on ward deprivation. Um, yes, models A, E and F, as councillor Hollier quite rightly outlined at the beginning um, of the meeting, um, that, that they all fall within the category of meeting the um, objectives set out for council in, in July 2023. <laughs> Members are therefore asked to consider the content of the report and, and feedback any comments to the executive members here tonight. Um, any, a, any consideration of the proposals uh, from this scrutiny that would change the existing approach would be considered at the executive on April the 18th and any allocations will be changed after that date. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if executive members want to add anything to, um, to what Polly said. Councillor Pavlovic. Thank you, Chair, and thank you um, both Ian and, um, and Pauline, um, and particularly Ian for um, the calculations. As you, as you pointed out, Chair, um, we said at the call-in, that um, we would bring this back um, and we said that we would give um, a number of um, methodologies, a number of formulae um, that um, we genuinely, and I genuinely, 
want to hear your opinion on. Um, it will be going to executive. Um, the the options of A, E and F seem to most closely fit the council plan criteria. Um, but you you may have a you you may have a different view. Doesn't mean I'm going to. It doesn't mean we're going to accept it. But it, it's uh, but it's genuinely interested in um, in, in the opinions that um, colleagues have. Thank you. Um, so I think we're, we're clear about the terms of engagement in terms of this discussion. Um, so I would invite comments from any members who um, have got their head around the numbers. Councillor Merritt. It's a question at this stage yeah, that's uh, fine. That's for fine. exactly the <laughs> reason you've just said. You're going to find the answer. <laughs> Um, the the report um, says in paragraph uh, 19, for the models set out in paragraph 12, models A and E most closely align with the council plan. I, I just wondered why um, only A and E and not F? Um, sorry, councillor. I, I hope I recognise that um, actually uh, model F does meet the criteria right. uh, in the council plan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, Councillor Eyre. I don't think it's a good one for this meeting, but I'll probably just ask you to explain E and F to me at some particular time when there's <laughs> there's more time available. But it's complicated. I think the bit I did want to ask about, and I raised I think at the calling as well, is what consideration is given to community assets as part of this. So it's one of the issues we said in terms of cost of delivery of some of the services. So for example, if you have an existing youth service running in an area, the cost of adding an extra few hours, et cetera, is a small amount. If there is nothing in that particular area and you're having to hire a venue, you're having to hire staff, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's considerably more difficult. So what have we done in terms of community asset-based analysis for each of all the different areas to feed into this calculation? reflect the answer I gave last time I think which was where we reflect community assets is in the neighbourhood action plans which should help um, members think about what's in their wards what the needs of the wards are um, and therefore direct the funding to those areas of need um, and the assets in that ward will determine what's already available or not available uh, available but I suppose the simple answer to your question is they're not built into any yeah. of these models. Yeah. yeah, I suppose it's, yeah, the <clears throat> the inputs are the same and you mentioned that the, the national data still hasn't been updated. So we that's 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 what we've got. Councillor Myers. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I can't quite understand the Model F and, uh, and, and, and the way that it throws up uh, the outcomes. You know, I'm happy to be ex explained at a, at a future date or potentially at executive when when the the next stage of this is, um, because in in my view, the index of multiple deprivation figures are more accurate in um, understanding the depth of poverty mm -hmm. within a community. And Model F doesn't seem to um, take that into account. Um, and, and I'm quite happy, Chair, to give a steer, in my view, that Models A and E do align with the Council plan. I really welcome uh, spending where there is most need. So there's a follow-on question, which I don't know, Ian might <clears throat> want to pick up it. So I looked at F and it, it seemed to produce um, some kind of, sort of counterintuitive outcomes, particularly in relation to, I'm not picking on Clifton Ward, but it, it, in particular in terms of it, it, it seemed to have a, a disproportionate impact on some wards. And it may be because of the inputs that, that Model F used that you would expect it to lead to that, that outcome. I, I just don't know whether if... If you noticed anything in terms of when you looked at the outputs from Model F, whether you thought, well, that that wasn't what was anticipated or or expected. 
think in all of the models, there'll always be a few misnomers or outliers. Um, within Model F, it, it tries to use deprivation in two or more dimensions. So within the census, there's four dimensions, education, employment, health and housing. But it doesn't quite use the same um, uh, kind of metrics that are inside the index of multiple deprivation, which is much more complicated. It's released much more frequently than the census, okay, which is why F wasn't on the proposal originally, because we'd hope we'd use index of multiple deprivation. It's used as pretty much as a national standard uh, across the areas. And within these dimensions, as I said, they're not as sophisticated. So employment's only looked through two lenses of, of unemployed or economic in inactive. Housing's looked a bit through overcrowding and shared ownership and that's maybe quite not what we're quite getting to with deprivation so does it bring out a few oddities misnomers yes probably but in the same way that when we described model a at the cooling and, and the funding formula there are the odd ward there that seems to have more deprivation under the index of multiple deprivation than we would expect and i think if i just refer back to council polio's comment before one of those wards is bishop thorpe in model a that's slightly outlies I think if we look through the table here for Model F, we'd find maybe one or two wards, whole row ward, whole road as an example, slightly less than we would expect for funding. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor Healy. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I would take the exact opposite view to Councillor Taylor, actually. Myers. My <laughs> oh, yeah, he's gone. That's right, right. Councillor Myers. Myers, sorry to apologise. Um, Looking at the table on page 43, Annex A, and if you look at the fourth col column along, which is the 2019 IMD, Model F, where you have Bishop Thorpe and Haxby and Wigginton, roughly the same, five point something. If you then look back at the table on page 40, table 14, and you look at F, Bishop Thorpe and Haxby, one gets one pound nineteen, one gets one pound twenty-three. So Model F irons out that issue that was identified at the initial call-in. If you go for A and E, you look at again. This is Table fourteen. If you look at Bishop Thorpe and Haxby again, that's when it seems to benefit rich but small to the debt to the detriment of basically big. So if there was to be a recommendation from this committee premised on the fact that we are trying to push this by deprivation. Um, I would say Model F meets that. Um, but as a ward councillor, I'd vote for Model A, as Stencil does slightly better. Well, that's for... Well, it's take a more strategic view. view. <laughs> Looking strategically, yeah. I think Model F wouldn't have got wouldn't get called in put it that way so is, is your under and, and the basis of that is that you think it it it, it more better addresses the big wards little it, wards. it it more cold more it consistently correlates with the imd data okay council lomas um i just want to uh caution against making assumptions about um areas and i think it's important to remind ourselves that there are sections of our communities who find themselves um potentially property rich and cash poor so they may have a large valuable property that they can't afford to heat and they can't afford to have a hot meal during the day um so i think we need to be quite cautious about making assumptions um, about what we might expect to see in different areas. I'd also just remind ourselves that each of the models that we, we're sort of focusing on um, has an element of funding that's a, a base level of funding that's allocated per number of councillors that's not, um, that, that doesn't take into account the um, levels of deprivation. And so that's going to give you a skew in terms of um, uh, what the, what the the final amount per head comes out at um but i would you know urge people not to make assumptions um about areas 
um, because you know that, that we need to be driven um, a little bit more by the the data that we get, and we shouldn't just assume that every single person in um, Bishop Thorpe is rich, which I think is what you were implying. Yes. Yeah. No. Um, I would agree with that, but what model would you suggest then that meets the concerns that you just raised? Um, I think the reason that it's here is is for it to be scrutinised pre-decision so that we can take into account the views of the committee. Okay. Councillor Bassey. Thank you, Chair. I'm listening to this with interest. I think there, there is a, a truth, I think, in the point that Councillor Lomas has just made, that larger populations may tend to have more assets in the community and also better public transport. So the whole thing is very, very complicated. Uh, I acknowledge that it's it's very complicated. In, in, in my particular ward, it can be argued, and it is in this report, that there is less deprivation. And I think that's probably true. But there are pockets of deprivation in my ward uh, where the lack of access to many community assets and the lack of access to decent public transport seriously limits uh, the ability of certain uh, people in the community to be able to participate in any community activity. And therefore, uh, those things like sharing life, for example, in my ward, uh, assume a greater importance for, for those people. So um, I'm not plumping for anything at this stage, but I recognise that it's, it is a very complicated task. <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor Widdowson. I'd just like to say that if you can get the deprivation figures, you know, as close as you can and as as well as you can, and I know Ian that you've worked extraordinarily hard to get them on there, and I would agree with Councillor Healy that the Model F seems to be taking those deprivation indicators into account, and that is applied across the city, regardless of whether it's a densely populated area or an area like Bishopsorp, all of which will have within their populations areas that need more help or people that need more help and people that need less help, regardless of what their age is and regardless of what their asset or cash situation is. So if you rely on the maths, which is the indication, the figures that you can get your hands on, and it's starting to come through in that one, then it seems to be fairly sensible. Councillor Merritt. There's no easy... There are clearly no easy answers on this. I mean, if, if you take the IMD, which is perhaps the more genuinely recognised indicator of deprivation as opposed to the two particular characteristics that are used in E, e and F, um, then there's two wards in this city that really do stand out as having a, a, a real problem in West, Westfield and Clifton. But if you actually use the particular indicators that have been chosen from the census, you'll see that one of those two wards certainly doesn't get the same degree of, of recognition uh, as uh, in those other two formula as it does in as it does in A. I think he's actually, I think whoever, you know, I think the executive actually have quite a difficult choice uh, to make uh, in in coming to a decision on this. I, uh, I am not particularly comfortable with F because, because I, I think it is not fully recognising the uh, deprivation, uh, you know, that, that we ought to be. But... Um, anyway, I'll hear the rest of the debate. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor Myers. Yeah. Thanks for coming back to me, Chair. Um, I just try to outline maybe a little bit of, of my point around these measures and, and how need is um, assessed. If you look at page 48, and, and 
Model F does it it's crudely grouping um uh indices of multiple deprivation together and and where the where there is more than one household nudging over a threshold uh to say that it's deprived and it's not calculating the level of that deprivation and that is what's totally missing from uh this model and that's why it flattens everything out and that means that it's not the best value for money spend if you're actually trying to spend money where it's most needed because you can contrast that directly to the table on page 43 that shows the indices of multiple deprivation which will show very stark contrasts between wards because the levels of deprivation are very starkly contrasting Clifton and Westfield and Tangall, some of those neighbourhoods have got, they're, they're in the top 10% in the whole country for multiple levels of deprivation affecting elderly people or affecting children. And to, to lump that in with, with a model against a model that doesn't take that into account, I mean, what? It's, it's, it's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. This is a small level of funding in the overall scheme of council spend. And direction of travel is good from the executive. You've got to keep it up and you've got to try and apply some of this thinking to more areas of spend. Because for many years, my community and communities like it have been underfunded by this council. And it's an absolute disgrace. And this is a small way forwards to give opportunities equally to those people in this city that absolutely deserve it. Thank you, Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, it, it, it kind of seems, a, a, apart from, you know, B and C, which are a non-starter, uh, whichever of these formula you look at, you're going to find some flaw in it. And, and, and maybe if I might just be able to throw a bit of a curveball in, um, and that's, if I look at my ward, the, the, there is, to my knowledge, very little deprivation compared to some of the other wards in the city. And if I look how we've allocated ward funding over the last five years, I, I, would, I would be hard pressed to find a need that had deprivation within it. So, so you know, for me, the, the idea of, 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 of having an, an element of, of, of funding based on deprivation within my ward, in, in some sense, for me, is hard to calculate. In terms of how you look at this as an executive, um, you know, it, it clearly all the models state that you've split out the £250,000, £105,000 based on councillors and £145,000 based on deprivation. Might I suggest, and this is, could be quite radical, that actually you keep the £145,000 centrally for members to be able to bid for any deprivation needs within their particular wards, and you simply allocate the 105,000 per councillor. So that's kind of rewriting it, and I maybe have thrown a curveball in there, but hey ho. No, I mean, I think the, <clears throat> the, the 145,000 element is it's still for ward, at ward level for it, for it to be, for decisions to be made. It's just, I mean, there is a separate central pot um, which organisations can bid into. So I think it's still, I think what you're saying is still there in terms of local, identify local need and then working with partners to decide how that money can best be allocated to meet the the ward, the ward priorities that are informed by the council plan. So I think that's, I think that's there. Yeah, that, I think that's that's what I'm saying is, so, yeah. so rather than giving me my, as, as the ward council of Osbury can do and giving me the slice of that £145,000, I'm saying that maybe a better way to do it would be to just divide the 105 per councillor and then have, a, have that 145 kept centrally where ward councillors could apply for needs within their ward that have a very strong deprivation case. That was what I was suggesting. I'll leave that with the executive members to, to consider. As, it's not, not technically what we were here to consider, but it's, you know, all, all ideas are welcome. Um, Councillor Healy and then Councillor uh, Yes, thank you. This is kind of officers. Um, 
page 43, model A, which is the one that's 45,000 to be split by each ward based on deprivation. If you go back to 14, so Bish, again, I'm, I'll take Bishop Thorpe and Haxby, but you can take any two that have a, a quite similar 2019 IMD deprivation score. Why is Model A still giving £1.50 to Bishop Thorpe and 87 pence to Haxby and Wigginton when their deprivation score is the same? Well, not the same, but, you know, it, very close. I feel as though we've had this discussion before. Yeah. Like, I'm sure it's best you can. Uh, I mean, look, there's, there's two other bits in, in the funding formula. So one is there is a councillor funding allocation, which obviously you may have boards that have two councillors or three councillors. And thirdly, they would move with different populations. So one's an overall total and one's a per head by population. So those wards will not have this. They may have the same index and multiple deprivation score, but they will have different populations. But table 14 is... Well, table 14, does it take both the council... Uh, pot of 100 grand plus the deprivation pot of 150 or is it just the deprivation pot on table 14 that's uh, both together so it'd be up to 250 and, that, and that's what makes it difficult to disentangle the yeah. because it's presented okay yeah. well I, as a committee i don't see how we can make the recommendation when none of us can understand well okay for my <laughs> sins i would work off table 14 but you can't because it combines the two pots. You need to desegregate the two pots. Councillor Rare. Hopefully a simple question. And in response to Councillor Rowley, as one of the councillors that worked with Councillor Pavlovic and Councillor Stewart on looking at the citywide pot and the complexities of dealing with how that is decided, allocated and everything, replicating that in year for another fund that would be entirely unworkable and I don't think the funding would ever get spent in that particular year and who would how that decision making process would go it would just be hugely onerous that worth that so my plea would be to not move towards that particular model which I suppose it gets me to that my actual question which should be relatively easy we're in year now so obviously this is not going to executive in April is it going in May or June and at what point will those allocations come through and at what point we're talking about getting this money to the people who need it the most, when will those individuals start to see that money? It's on the forward plan for April's executive, if there's a change that results from this meeting. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Does anybody else have any other further comments, questions? I think the one thing... My observation is I, I kind of feel as though we're in a similar place to we were at the call in in the the kind of the exam question then was well why is um, uh, the deprivation allocation for a big ward and a small ward similar uh, I think we've unpacked a bit more of the detail in terms of. <clears throat> don't judge a board by its cover necessarily. And I think that's something that I think we need to reflect on. I think Mod F does produce some some out, outputs which I think are not in not necessarily in line with what the policy direction is. So I'd, I'd be nervous about Mod F. Model E seems to go some way towards addressing some of the questions and concerns that were raised about Model A. Um, one could argue that it makes such a small difference. Is it? Is it? Is there a significant um, basis on which to switch to it? I think it, it seems to me to perform a bit better and be a bit more um, take into account those <clears throat> issues of, of ward sides a little bit better. But if there was a better solution, I'm sure somebody would have come up with it. Um, and it's certainly not going to be me <laughs> with my GCSE maths that not really in that category. Um, does anyone else have any other observations? Councillor Pavlovic. 
Um, I'm happy to defer to Councillor Rowley if he's got another okay, question. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. I mean, the, you know, the, the request obviously was for us to have a look at this and then kind of come back, you know, with with, with a recommendation. And I think we've we've agreed that it's going to be difficult to do that this this evening. And 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 how implicit that is to the decision making session, I don't know. And I absolutely, you know, respect the work that Paul and Ian have done. Um, so so rather than having to kind of make a decision this evening, I mean, would it would it be prudent? For those of us that are able to give it a little bit more thought, just to feed back our thoughts directly to the, uh, the executive member or to the uh, to the officers. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> to be clear, we're not a decision making uh, body, and um, you know, I think a number of views have been expressed around the table about preferred models. So I'm not going to say let's have a vote mm -hmm. because. It, point, you know, good good points have been made in support of all models. I think. Um, the executive members, I would uh, expect to kind of consider what's been said and then and then take a view when it comes to the decision, which will be at executive and that, that but that will be a public meeting and then if members can attend and speak at if they wish. But I'm sure um, officers and executive members would would welcome any further thoughts and comments by correspondence if after tonight's meeting you have a eureka moment about. A model G that could perhaps do something <laughs> different while still being in line with um with oh, policy intent. Does anybody else did anybody else let's say anything else? Councillor Pavlovic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And 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 I just genuinely want to thank everybody around the table. You've clearly given it you've clearly given it thought and you've clearly considered the options which we will take into account um before we meet to exec. Um just on a non methodology um, point, um, uh, questions have been raised with me um, separately about how um, the um, sign off and the um, spend of ward funding um, is is done. Um, and there are going to be some slight amendments both to the um to the form that um uh, applicants will have um and the guidance that's given to members when they're considering uh applications so um and then there's also just the point that i do want to re-emphasize it has been emphasized and, uh, and all members are aware of it is that there are no carryovers at year end. So any um, unspent money um, at the end of the financial year um, uh, will be um, will not be carried over um, for that ward into the um, into the next year. Um, and um, uh, having had conversations with the uh, exec member for finance. Um, and with um, with Pauline, um, we would look to use any unspent money uh, to support the YFAS scheme um, and um, to make sure that any unspent money is used to support those people who are most vulnerable and, um, and most in need of it. Um, and I'm very grateful to the exec member for um, agreeing that today. Mm -hmm. um, the other point I would just like to emphasise is, and a question has been raised with me by Councillor Eyre about um, allocations of um, money for projects that won't be completed within that financial year. Um, ideally, of course, um, money will be allocated and it will be spent um, and will be delivered in that financial year. There are some applications that will come through uh, late in the financial year, for example, things that come through January, February, March time, um, well, hopefully not March, um, January, February time, um, that um, by the time it's signed off, it would be very unlikely to be spent. So I have clarified that with um, the Section 151 officer. Um, 
and those will be allowed. So, um, you know, where, where, where schemes, for example, I'll just give you an example. Um, you've got a wildflowering scheme or, or, or a planting scheme that you couldn't plant it in December or January or February. Um, it would have to be the new growing season. Um, that money could be allocated this financial year and spent the next financial year. So I hope that clarifies the point that you raised. Yeah, I, th I think it... <clears throat> well, I know through discussion with my uh, community officer that um, we had to spend the money, otherwise it, it wouldn't be carried forward. It, I don't know whether that's been sent, sent out as a in an email to all, all members so that there's awareness of that. It may have been, I've missed it, but if it hasn't, it'd be helpful if that could be done just so there's clarity for everybody. Absolutely, but I just did want yeah. to just raise yeah, yeah. it here at this committee. Yeah. No, no, that, that, um, I appreciate that. So. Um, first, um, okay. before making an arbitrary decision, though notwithstanding that, I've just made an arbitrary decision. <laughs> um, you had your hand up, Councillor. I think it, it was just to make that point because I, I thought I was clear until you clarified and now I'm not clear. And I think it might just be the use of terms as to what, because you did specifically say at the beginning, anything unspent would not be carried forward. And then you went on to say some things would be. So I, I think it's just maybe an email that clarifies precisely what the what the issue is would be easier. Yeah. Yeah, just, just, just to be uh, use some different language um, to say the same thing. This is about schemes which were applied for in the current financial year, which had the decision made and signed off, crucially signed off um, at director level um, during the current financial year and were, you know, where for, for a very specific reason could not be completely delivered during the current financial year. Um, so because you, if you sow wildflower seeds, then they will die. Um, so it's a waste of money. Um, then, then they will be honoured, but they have to have been decided on and signed off by the director um, before the cut-off date, um, which I believe is the 21st. The 21st of March um, is the cut-off date by which they all would need to be signed off um, is that Thursday? Thank you. Um, uh, in order to be honoured, um, so there's okay. there's you know there is quite a clear quite clear guidance has been given to the community officers who should be um, supporting all members with those applications. And that's okay. why Councillor Lomas deals with finance, and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that additional nugget of information. That's that's very helpful. Um, thank you. So that concludes that agenda item, which leaves us with agenda item seven, which is the uh, <clears throat> finance and performance monitor for quarter three, which Patrick has been waiting very patiently, will join us at the table. Um, members will be familiar with uh, the format of this report. Um, it is information that's been to executive. We are receiving a, um, a, a a cut of that that relates to the responsibilities of this committee, um, and it, paragraph thirteen is the is the key um, the key focus as far as the responsibilities of of, of this committee is concerned. Um, is there anything you would like to say by way of introduction, Patrick? Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, that's. Uh... Very much what I was about to say. Uh, one area I would just like to highlight, and I know it's been the topic of conversation at previous scrutinies, is the uh, pressure across that we're reporting across benefits. Uh, the majority of that pressure is actually through housing benefit. It's through uh, increases in numbers that we are putting through temporary accommodation. Uh, we cannot reclaim the full amount of uh, what we're paying out in bed and breakfast accommodation and hostel accommodation from the Department for Work and Pensions. It is sitting as an additional cost to the council, primarily due to the local housing allowance rate that hasn't increased for a large number of years. Uh, the good news on that one, 
uh, is that the there has been an announcement of an increase in the local housing allowance rate for next year of about 25%, which should reduce that pressure going forward, but it's still going to be ongoing. What we will try and do uh, is represent this more as a cost of housing and homelessness and the requirement of temporary accommodation rather than it being lost and aligned across corporate services, which is seen as a an impact on the benefits when actually the driver of that cost is the numbers of people who require temporary accommodation. Thank you for that uh, update, Councillor Merritt. Yeah. Um, Could I ask uh, about um, OCC06B, uh, which is the number of days taken to process housing benefit, where there appears to have been a bit of a blip uh in the current first two quarters i just wondered what was happening there and i mean it does seem to the second quarter is better than the first but um what what's been going on i'm not i'm not sure i can tell you exactly what's been going on with it councillor Merritt, but um yeah i mean we've still been sitting we've historically this measure is plated by the DWP, not by ourselves. So it's not an internal process that we can look at and look at the efficiency of. So the DWP provide the figures to, and normally myself and somebody like David Walker will just keep an eye on it to see if it sits outside of the benchmark level. Now you can see there that historically we've been very much lower than that's the benchmark around about three days. And you're right, there has been a rise up by a day or three days in terms of quarter one. It's not something that's really outstripped the benchmark. So we haven't discussed with the DWP about their internal processes. It's something I can pick up between myself and David Walker and I can I can give you a note about it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um I had a quick question on paragraph 19. Um coroner related pressures within the governance department. 115,000. I just wondered if you could explain a bit more about that, please. Uh, we're very much reliant on paying the coroner for the cost that he or she is incurring in part of their investigations, uh, how long they hold on to uh, storage of uh, bodies effectively. Uh, so there has been a pressure that whether that's to do with the number of investigations or whether the amount of time that he's been or she's been required to hold on to the evidence. Uh, it's something that's outside of our control and I know the Director of Governance and uh, Head of Legal Services have conversations with the coroner in terms of trying to identify what pressures are coming forward but it really is something that sits outside of our control and we just have to deal with the costs as and when they come through. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other question, Councillor Vassi? Just a point that comes to mind, I think I've probably said this before at some other point, but in paragraph 16, we hear about the historical income shortfalls at the Mansion House. Um, there is a castle in Switzerland that I've been to five or six times in my life. Not because I want to be in the castle every time I go to Switzerland, but because they have surrealist art exhibitions. They find ways of using a venue to create an exhibition space that people will come to again and again. And whenever I see these problems in the mansion house, what comes to me is our seeming continued inability to create revenue by exploiting and exploring the use of spaces. Um, I don't know what can be done about it. I hope that the council will eventually do something about it. The mansion house is beautiful, but I wouldn't go in there once a year just to see it. I might go there more than once a year if there was something new in there. <clears throat> Councillor Lomas. Um, Councillor Vassi, um, you'll be delighted to know um, that we are exploring um, all options that we can um, to make sure that the Mansion House does um, retain its important position in the in the historical life of the city. Um, and you'll recall perhaps from the discussions of only last month about the budget that we've committed capital investment 
um, to making sure that we do um, necessary upgrades and repairs, both structural and safety related at the mansion house so that we can indeed make the most of it as a, as a marvellous asset for the city. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Healy. Uh, yeah, super quickie. Um, STF08, full Which time. Which page are we on? Um, page 59. Okay. Um, it's about halfway down. Uh, staff FTEs. It, it might be quite useful if in the body of the report it said something along the lines of the FTEs are going up because we're replacing agency staff, which is good. Because I would expect, given the funding pressures that we're under, the number of FTEs to be declining over roughly over time. Yeah, I think that's a fair comment. Um, page 59 of this report, I tried to pull a few other extra indicators that aren't just in the council plan that might be pertinent to the committee together. Um, Mm -hmm. Councillor Healy's right that the increase there in the FTE and this indicator includes schools as well has been because of the numbers of working with York have probably halved over the last year or so, 18 months. And um, as, as Helen said before, when she spoke on her item, most people have moved on to the establishment. Um, there is quite a lot more detail about um, staffing numbers, FTE and headcount that goes to the Staffing Matters and Urgency Committee on a six month basis. We try and cover the patterns of why the FT and headcount are moving. Um, the latest report went there about two months ago. So and I think it has those paragraphs in. I don't mind duplicating effort and putting them in both yeah, reports. I'll, I'll okay. <clears throat> Thank you, really. Any other questions or comments from members? <clears throat> no. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Thank you, Ian. So last but not least, uh, work plan. So page 61, uh, you see our next meeting in April. Uh, we've got a substantive item on procurement, which uh, Debbie Mitchell will be <clears throat> uh, bringing a report for. Uh, and also we return to the topic of climate change, which as we're all aware is now part of this committee's um, remits. Um, and Sean Gibbons will be giving us uh, an update on that. And with the, um, the vice chair and I have been in touch with Sean to make sure that we get maximum benefit from that, that discussion in terms of <clears throat> um, sort of future policy development. Uh, so hopefully that will be a, uh, a an interesting meeting. Just going back to the minutes of the last meeting on page seven, there were a couple of uh, task and finish topics suggested um, uh, on section one of six agreements and one on council communications. Um, we now have a template for members to use in order to um, put forward ideas for task and finish groups and it's structured in a way to hopefully make the process easier in terms of identifying what are the aims and objectives, who do you want to talk to and what the time scale is. So what it's probably an idea for if democratic service services can help is to circulate that template um, to members of this committee um, asking if any members do want to give some thought to putting down on paper what task and finish groups might look like in relation to section 106 agreements and council communications um it would give us something to to discuss a, a bit with in a bit more detail at the next meeting dawn yeah just to add to that chair um the template seeks or if you like, a lead member from the committee in relation to each of those um, topics to complete the template out of the version that you did on the dialer right chair for EPAT. So um, 
when I circulate it. You can yeah. ask for somebody. You can ask for somebody. <laughs> That's the point I was going to make. So, to volunteer to complete. Yes, because it won't complete itself. <laughs> much much though we may wish it would. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's helpful. Um, um, yeah, on section one or six, I think there were a number of strands to that discussion. One, at least one of which um, members might like to pick up. But we will see if a, a brave person puts themselves forward to to lead on that. Okay, Councillor Merritt. Yeah, can I thank uh, you as chair and uh, council uh, colleagues uh, in terms of sorting that template? I think very helpful. Yeah. And apologies for uh, being slightly remiss on one of those. Oh, I do like a good template. <laughs> um, so there are no urgent business, um, <laughs> other than to say, I understand we have to wish a member of the committee happy birthday. So I'd like to wish Councillor Merritt, a happy, and you can enjoy what's left of of your birthday. Um, <laughs> happy birthday and good night.